people joining us just now. If you haven't yet, let us know in the chat where you're joining from today. But thrilled that you're all here to uh, hear from these wonderful panelists. So here's, here's the scoop on today. To accomplish nearly anything in life, we need to work with others. Today's careers require collaboration more and more with teams of diverse and specialized people. And this is often taking place virtually. But the thing that makes teams great, their different backgrounds, their personalities, their expertise, can also make them fail. It takes solid leadership, effective communication, a sense of community, and the right technology to get collaboration right. So today we've got Boston Scientific founder, John Abley, in space CEO and AI expert, uh, in Noreen Hall, and Champlain College Professor Emerita of Emergent Media, Anne DeMarle, and they're here to discuss the collaboration paradox. They'll share their insights on building effective, productive, and innovative teams that can thrive in our complex world. In just a moment, I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator, Anne DeMarle, but first I want to point out a couple of features that will help you engage fully today. So let's direct our attention up to the top right of your screen. I'm looking at that sidebar where you all might be in the chat. The home button shows everyone who's attending our session today. And after the event today, we're going to meet up in the networking lounge for further discussion and connection. After the conversation concludes today, I'll show you more about how to move spaces, but you can already see in that right toolbar that you've got visibility into other spaces here in our session. Next up, you can tap the CC button on the right side to activate closed captions at any time for yourself. Many of you already found the chat, but if you haven't, uh, drop your questions in the chat today using that uh, dialog bubble icon. At any point, you can also enlarge your view of what's on screen here. Uh, to do that, you can use your mouse wheel to scroll in or use trackpad gestures. And of course, to show support or enthusiasm for other people's ideas, especially our wonderful panelists up on stage, you can place your mouse over their circle and give them a thumbs up. And I would love for you to try that out right now as I welcome Anne tomorrow to the stage. Come on up, Anne. All right, let's give Anne some thumbs up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see some folks I know uh, putting their name up here and where they're from. Um, it's really my honor today to be here. Um, growing up in a very large family, collaboration was instilled in us since an early age. Literally, it was the clearest uh, path to surviving and smiling while I was growing up. But seriously, uh, throughout my career, first as a designer and technologist, and then later as a professor and an interim dean for a while, I found that collaboration to be the secret sauce of success for any type of endeavor. Uh, teaching collaborative methods has been a key ingredient of my career. However, I've also seen it misapplied and it tends to become a buzzword and it's widely misunderstood and misemployed. There is still much I'm learning on the discipline. So today I'm honored, really honored to discuss collaboration with two folks that uh, I think bring up depth of both experience, knowledge, and, and success through strong collaborative practices. So I'd like to first introduce Noreen Hall. Noreen, if you could join us. There she is. Hi, Noreen. Hi, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I first met Noreen when she was a newly minted uh, professor at Champlain, and I was and continue to be greatly uh, impressed by her energy and expertise. When she first introduced me to an early version of InSpace, I was literally blown away. Um, as a co-founder and CEO of InSpace, she has built a collaborative platform rooted in neuroscience that's revolutionizing online learning with human connection through uh, flexible and delightful experiences that empower students and teachers, which we get to experience today. Created with research and collaborative input from over 500 educators, in space gives both educators and students agency to, and freedom to learn on their terms and to collaboratively 
um, explore and learn together. Um, she's done, she's a data scientist, a computer scientist. She's got a wealth of real experience behind her. So Noreen, welcome. Please say a few words. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here today and see everyone here joining us in the auditorium. Inspace has been such a collaborative effort. We have been hearing so many amazing people and it's just such a fun, exciting experience to be part of it. So I'm an absolute newbie to collaboration, so I don't have you know, experience in, uh, in that space. But I think it's really just like when it just happens, it's just such a magical moment. And you know, it, it's always been such a fun moment to discuss this with Ed. So Anne and I go back at Champlain College and it's been so incredible to have her kind of uh, in her, her mentorship throughout this process. And I'm just really thrilled to be part of the conversation and looking forward to see where it goes. I also want to just quickly add, so uh, John Abley, I'm really excited that he was able to join us today. Uh, he has been a friend and mentor for me for quite a while now. And there's always such fascinating conversations in that collaboration, cooperation space. And uh, Anne and John are the best experts in the space. And you're on mute. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Anne, and thank you, Noreen. Um, I'm, I'm uh, here because of an interest in collaboration that came out of many, many years of experience in the medical field. And I think an awful lot of people feel that, you know, doctors and nurses and so forth are examples of great collaboration. But in fact, that's not quite the case. Different specialties uh, talk different language. And uh, obviously you have people who come from different countries and different cultures. So frequently words that they understand are not understood by others. So creating a collaboration is not a simple thing. And that's what we'll talk about uh, here. Oh, and you're, you're, uh, you're on mute. You're you might want to unmute. That's oh, great. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on John, and then we're going to jump into a presentation. Um, I met John, I think, over 20 years ago at Champlain. I was a newly minted professor then myself. Um, and I just created this game degree at Champlain, which is really based on collaboration. They have to collaborate to also uh, succeed there. And so we immediately hit it off. And then uh, about five years ago, I was lucky to co-teach a class with John on collaboration and leadership. So I think you'll get a lot from this uh, conversation. I know I keep learning. From young gadgeteer to medical device pioneer, John's career has made him a leader in moving innovation to the mainstream. He's devoted himself to innovation in healthcare and business and solving social problems. He is a retired founding chairman of Boston Scientific Corporation and holds numerous patents of, and has published and lectured extensively on technology of various medical devices and technical, social, economic, and political trends and issues affecting healthcare. His primary interests are science literacy for children, education, and how new technology is invented um, and introduced to society. One of his passions, and I think a great place to see collaboration being taught and utilized is his work with FIRST Robotics, an international program that works with high school kids to make being science literate cool and fun. Um, Others, the King's, the Kingbridge Conference Center and Institute, an institution whose mission to research, develop, and teach planning, learning, and helping groups become collectively intelligent is an important part of his work. He lives with his wife and dog right here in Vermont. So um, John and Noreen, thank you for being here. And I'd like to turn the, the stage over to John for um, some really deep learning that we can all experience about collaboration. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I think I'm being heard now. Um, uh, I'm going to start out with a, a few slides to try to explain uh, what uh, collaboration is, and more importantly, what it what it is not. Uh, 
basically, you have to start out with the definition of collaboration. And that is on the slide, working together to achieve a common goal. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the problem is there are many ways collaboration can have in forms. You can be uh, with people. You can do it physically. Uh, you can do it asynchronously, uh, virtual, of course, uh, over phone or over ver uh, video, uh, whatever. They can be long and short. Uh, they can be large and tiny, and they can be broken up into many pieces. But all of those require design. Next slide, please. And there are levels of collaboration. Uh, in the lower left, you think of uh, actually the, the picture there should be people walking on the street. That's intuitive collaboration. People don't bump into each other. They don't have to think about it. Now, of course, if they're looking at their smartphone uh, while they're walking the street, sometimes they do bump into people. But before smartphones, we didn't bump into people as often. Uh, you have driving a car, that's an intuitive form of uh, collaboration. Then you have uh, playing in an orchestra uh, or, or musical group, and that requires a skills uh, a background of collaboration. But they're great examples of collaboration. Uh, you have these sort of automatic collaborations where people will do jazz or perhaps playing basketball where people are working together and from a distance, you can't really tell, but they know what each other is doing. They behave as a group. And ideally, that's what a good collaboration does. And then you have very complex uh, uh, collaborations or even massively uh, complex uh, collaborations like you know, going to the moon, for example. Those are very, very complex levels. And the more complex they get, the more difficult they become. Next slide, please. So there are attributes of any one collaboration. Uh, you know, the, the real problem frequently is, is there a, a clear definition of what you're trying to do? I think this is something that happens a lot where uh, pe people meeting, people's meetings fail because they haven't desired, defined exactly what they uh, hope to come with an outcome. Uh, whether you have a few people or a lot of people is something you have to uh, understand. And frequently you choose that if you're doing it in the form of meetings. Uh, and then is it going to be a dedicated time or is it going to take place over time? That's an awful lot of uh, collaboration. But when they take place over time, then you have to figure out how do you best use those different time periods. And then, of course, within a collaboration, you have people with different experiences, knowledge, age, culture, et cetera. Uh, these are factors that are important to understand. Just like a teacher deals with a variety of students, one student can upset the class, if you will, or, one, or a group of people will understand, but the others won't understand. Therefore, you have to design your teaching in a collaborative form. So you get the ones who know to help the ones who don't know and so forth. Next slide, please. So more and more uh, different types of collaboration. Command and control, sort of the military thing. That's We all know that and we see it. Uh, but that is a collaboration where basically everybody is supposed to do what the boss wants. And uh, it's, it's uh, although it is absolutely a form of collaboration, it's not the same as harnessing the, the uh, brilliance of everybody in the group. A facilitated collaboration, uh, that can be done by an outsider or an internal leader. Self-organizing, uh, where people help organize it themselves. Egalitarian, that's one that is an interesting word, egalitarian, but uh, that's where anybody can speak up and end up accidentally uh, disrupting the discussion, and that sometimes that can be a problem. Adversarial collaboration seems like an oxymoron. Uh, how can you collaborate if, in fact, you're on opposite sides? Well, that happens every day when you negotiate a, a contract or a position or whatever it might be. 
that means that you have some potential conflicts of interest and you have to deal with them. Pseudo collaborations, well, those are collaborations that where somebody's cheating. They're pretending to collaborate, but they're not. So be aware of that. That can be a real problem. Uh, the word collaborate, remember, uh, can mean to collaborate with the enemy. And that's the bad version uh, of it, of course. Uh, mass collaboration, we're seeing more of that now uh, with ingenious uh, apps on the internet that enable that. Crowdsourcing, where you can work with a huge group of people uh, to uh, uh, solve very complex problems and of course combinations of any of the, uh, of the above. But the message here is you have to know which one you're in or who the people are are that you have chosen or not chosen. Sometimes you have to lead a collaboration where the members are people that you would not necessarily have picked yourself. Uh, you, you've got to have a different strategy or leadership depending on what you're dealing with. Next slide, please. But there are barriers to collaboration. Uh, obviously you have conflicting cultures or silos uh, particularly when you have a more diverse uh, a bunch of uh, participants. You have strong egos. You have messenger killers. Uh, you have pontificators, people you can't turn off. Uh, they just keep talking and talking about things that aren't relevant to what you're trying to do. You have hidden agendas sometimes or vested interests. Uh, makes me think about what was going on in the uh, climate uh, talks recently, which were being held in a country whose major business is oil. And therefore, there were more people <laughs> sort of uh, advocating uh, for the opposite of what uh, the meeting was supposed to accomplish. You have things like groupthink. Uh, sometimes people aren't aware that groupthink is taking place, but uh, it's the sort of thing that once somebody introduces an idea, sometimes it becomes politically incorrect to oppose that idea. Uh, you have off-topic time wasters. That's, you know, particularly for pontificators, uh, diverse levels of understanding. Do people understand or have the same understanding? Uh, and of course, a range of bias and political correctness. All of these things can cause a collaboration to fall apart or not come together in the first place. Next slide, please. Now, this is a sort of a famous cartoon from The New Yorker, but it really is a great example of the fact that sometimes you think you've got a very collaborative audience, but in fact, they don't. Uh, everybody's saying I down in the bottom, but of course, in their bubbles of their thought, uh, they are not agreeing at all. Very common problem. Next slide, please. And it's everybody recognizes when you're not getting together. And frequently, it's a joke. And this book s summarizes the major problems, Cyro's politics and, and turf wars. Next slide, please. This is sort of a, a, a famous theoretical picture uh, of the Tower of Babel. And of course, the Tower of Babel was a good example of people not getting along together. They were speaking different languages. They didn't understand each other. Well, uh, I like to suggest that that was perhaps the first conference facility that didn't work very well. Next slide, please. This was a, a fascinating article many years ago. Surgical teams found lacking in teamwork uh, you have to sort of love that story. This is the example that I saw all the time because of the medical world. Many times you'd have a surgeon who was a brilliant surgeon, but of course they tend to have a strong ego. And of course to them, collaboration is when everybody does what he or she says. And uh, this was actually an experiment conducted by uh, a business school that studied surgical teams and found that they really weren't good on the team, teamwork department and they were teaching them how to be better at it. Next slide, please. So conclusion generally, and hopefully this is what the discussion will uh, 
focus on, collaborations don't just happen. They need to be designed and curated. You need to know who is there. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to keep out uh, the uh, critics of what you're talking about? If you do that, all you will have done is armed the critic with the excuse that you didn't have the courtesy of inviting me. So these are things that are all part of the very delicate political process of creating a very productive collaboration. Next slide, please. So ultimately, it's a series of paradoxes, if you think of that. Uh, the collaboration paradox is a, is a term that I've used in a lot of my, my talks and, and, and writings uh, about this. The need, for example, to cede control before you gain control. The more you share, the more you gain. They seem like paradoxes, but in fact, they're really important. You maintain curiosity while demonstrating confidence. Think about that. People want leaders to be very, very confident. But if the leader isn't, doesn't have enough curiosity about what's going on and admit that they don't have all the answers, they're going to make some really bad decisions. And over the years, very, very uh, important people have, and bright people have made dumb decisions because they, didn't, uh, they weren't open enough to uh, make sure they uh, listened to everybody and that they were curious to make sure that they were asking the right questions. Being confident, but humble. Willingness to not take credit. These are perhaps obvious, perhaps not. And people think frequently that many leaders are not inclined to do that. They want to demonstrate the fact uh, they're a leader. That's the difference between a man manager and a leader. Uh, the, the leader really is focused on the mission of the meeting, which is to have an answer that you can uh, make a decision from. Uh, other people simply want to have a meeting that people feel good about. Next slide, please. All right. Or is that the last one? I think that is the last one. So let's let's stop there and and go into the discussion now uh, about how do you how are you as a collaborator. Uh, how do you address these questions, the, the barriers that uh, are listed there? Think about it. I want to encourage folks that you can post comments in response to any questions and any thoughts, and we will be collecting them up and responding to them um, as we do this discussion. So feel free to please post. Um, one of the things that I want to kind of summarize some of the key takeaways from this. I mean, time and again, I've been thrown into groups. Uh, groups are thrown together and people just say, OK, collaborate. I've seen it lots of times in classrooms and uh, some of those in education here as a dean. I can't tell you how many professors got pinged because, well, we weren't really learning how to collaborate at all. Um, and so-and-so did all the work. So it's really a kind of a tough thing and even in groups. Um, so again, just overall, there are levels of collaboration. There are attributes and types, different types, which I always find is an eye opener to think about. Um, and uh, especially uh, thinking about adversarial, mm -hmm. And uh, pseudo, you know, you don't really, that doesn't usually come to mind. Uh, the barriers. I think we all recognize when we hit a barrier in collaboration, but we don't necessarily know what it is and how to pivot from those barriers. Um, and then perhaps hardest to maintain the paradoxes. I really, it's like a teeter-totter, I think. And uh, it's, you go, you, you can slide one way or the other off of those paradoxes. And uh, I told John once, I said, I, I also think that those paradoxes are kind of um, exemplars of what leadership is all about, is to be able to, um, to manage that type of um, balance beam. So um, I'd like to start with, actually, I had a different question, but I'd really like to think about, um, open it up about that um, 
the Babel. I mean, I love that. The Tower of Babel was kind of a construction project that failed. I think we've seen those kind of things happen before. And the fact that it's based on language really shows how far back uh, you know, the, the human race has realized that collaboration is something that's pretty important and communication is key. Um, and I'd like to think about, um, John, you mentioned something about message killers and then political correctness. I mean, they seem counter opposed. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on like if, if we're uh, what a message killer really looks like and how is someone facilitating a group? how we deal with both the message killers and um, the political correctness, because political correctness is kind of being nice, isn't it? Uh, it, it political correctness is being nice for the wrong reason, uh, not to hurt anybody. But unfortunately, that means you're not, you don't get at the tough questions. It's like tough love. Uh, that's the good version. But political correctness is something that people do in order to avoid something that might offend somebody. But in fact, it's very important to make sure you understand all the factors that go into making a successful decision or making a decision successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, these factors that exist politically, we're certainly listening to literally every single day. The presidents of Harvard, uh, MIT, and, and University of Pennsylvania lecturing before Congress, they were caught in that, that bubble. They were trapped in political correctness. And uh, it, it was a, a very difficult thing for them. Obviously, the president of uh, University of Pennsylvania resigned. We'll see about the others. Now, there's obviously a lot of other politics going on in that. But that is an opportunity for collaboration. Congress is supposed to collaborate. It's not doing a very good job of that. But we need to collaborate just to accomplish things that we're doing. Mm -hmm. In the medical world, obviously, where most of my uh, experience is based, that has been the challenge. And I've been awed by some of the ingenious things, really forms of behavior, nothing to do with medicine, just ways to bring people of opposite position, if you will, onto the ability to discuss it. Uh, there's a the, the president of Harvard, uh, by the name of Derek Bott, some years ago, had to make a quick decision at Harvard. And to do that, that means the, he has to get the faculty to agree. Now, it's a huge faculty. You can't get them all together. So they have a faculty senate. He brought that faculty senate together. And there was about 25 or 30 of them, that order of magnitude. And he said, we're going to do this meeting differently. We've got to make a decision quickly. So I am going to go around the table here and I'm going to tell each one of you what you were going to tell me, or at least my understanding of that. And then when I finish, I want you to tell me if I got anything wrong or I left anything out. And he did that. He went around the table. And in fact, you'd think Maybe only the president of Harvard could get away with that. But the principle, in fact, is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. He was actually honoring those people by saying, I've worked hard to understand you. And this is my interpretation. Therefore, this is a measure of the fact that I am a listener and I'm trying to do that. So, uh, you know, two of the outcomes that that took place as a result of this rather strange style is number one, they did make a decision, which is heretical and most uh, faculties getting faculties to agree is, you know, classic oxymoron again. Uh, and the other thing, it didn't actually take that long. Now, there were subtleties within what he did exactly because he picked the most difficult person first. <clears throat> the person that he knew was going to be the big disagreeer. But he had listened to that person and he did understand their points. And therefore he was able to satisfy that person and set the example for everybody else in the room that this can be done. So they were inclined to collaborate. 
So now I hope you get a little bit of the subtleties of great collaboration strategies that good leaders have. They're doing it all the time. Good teachers do that. But it's hard to do. It's developed over many years of experience and lots of understanding of how people behave when they have these different attributes. John, that is such a fascinating example, how um, listening, how important the role of listening is in collaboration. And when I think about like sort of the core human skills, collaboration being one of the most complex ones in that list, active listening is such a big part of that as well. And just thinking about like all the seven layers of active listening and how hard it is really to train in that. And, um, you know, traditionally in our colleges, we don't teach that, right? We, there's no course that teaches active listening or collaboration or teamwork. Those are, uh, you know, they used to be called the soft skills. And it's fascinating how they're really coming to the front now with AI and everything happening. And those are really the core human skills that I, I think are going to be a huge part of the future of work. And it, it's really fascinating what a big difference it makes how people connect the dots through the active listening and how big of a role it has in collaboration itself. I think sometimes people get a little bit confused and uh, sometimes the answer to a meeting that didn't go well is more meetings. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the worst thing that you can do. The idea is to have a good meeting in the first place. And, uh, you know, how much is enough? Should it be a 10 minute meeting or should it be a half hour meeting? Uh, some of the doctors, you know, who are always conducting courses or programs on the specialty that they are focused on. So they teach others about that. And I was particularly involved in a lot of very new and innovative medical procedures that were dramatic. And the question is, is how do you talk about that to a group of people who have grown up being very conservative in terms of understanding the risks of medicine? It, doctors, number one, do no harm. Now, some that don't get that, but most of them absolutely do. And therefore, they're a little bit concerned about too much innovation. And so having a meeting that talks about how the people in the audience can learn about what it's about, what the risks are, what the benefits are, how to solve problems, because you don't want to just go into it. You don't want to be the first person on whom the procedure is tried. Let's, let's say it that way. And uh, that, to me, is key. I heard, actually, this was in, in the paper the other day on the New York Times, uh, a thing about forensic listening. You know, think about that. Forensic is the process of, again, solving crimes, if you will. But in fact, it's the whole uh, using novel techniques to try to understand what the different meanings of what the person is saying. A lot of people will tell you that actually more communication takes place nonverbal than verbal. The way people move, their facial expressions, the emphasis on the words that they, they put makes a huge difference. And you will hear the same words differently if there are different people in the audience because you begin to put the bias of your understanding of those people on the person who's speaking. These are all subtle things that people have studied psychologically. And how do you create that environment so that you really accomplish twice as much? And that's, that's the goal. We have to learn to figure out how we can harness the collective intelligence of a group. And that includes different views. They may conflict. That's fine. But we're going to learn from their understanding of how that conflict may affect the results of what we're doing. I love how you mentioned uh, the, the need to have the right environment for active listening, right? So one of my favorite books is actually this book called How to Listen. It's by Oscar Trimboli. And in that, he uses this very interesting example of this person who works actually at Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And his job is to talk to people 
who are trying to jump off the bridge. And as you can imagine, it's a very high risk moment. And one of the things that he mentions there is the importance of the listening skill and the environment. Like he, he mentions how he always comes down to the level of the person, eye level, before having that conversation because it makes so much difference how they it, how they perceive them. Like, I'm not above you. I'm not here just to say what to do. I'm here to listen. And you know, some of those things like you never want to say calm down. Like, it never works, <laughs> right? And then sort of going into this notion of like the gestures, like when you say yes, or even the subtle sounds, right? When you say, mm -hmm, yes, like those things are so important for the person to feel like they're being heard and what they're saying is meaningful and they're being seen. And I think when I think about that, some of the pieces like the environments in virtual space, it's a little bit harder to replicate, but it's so critical for that human authentic connection and that listening piece as, as it comes to, um, you know, collaboration. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to delve a little deeper deeper into that because I found um, John in your initial slide where you showed the levels, you know, starting with intuitive. You know, we all know how to walk in a crowd until cell phones came along to that point. Um, and then at your higher levels, I, I was lucky. I just went to a small symphony. I saw Handel's Messiah, and I was just blown away by uh, both the music and the sound, but also watching the interactions of the conductor who is also playing a harpsichord at the same time and directing, you know, subtle hand movements in this group, in this group. And um, so when I look at something like that, it's obviously lots of training, lots of skill, a, a, a common language. But then when you get up in further levels, when you bring in diversity, when you bring in technology, then, um, you know, especially the diversity question, how do we design for diverse audiences where culturally and even um, gender, we're taught different ways of responding. Thoughts on how to design, uh, let's say, uh, since I was just a dean, a space for 20 people to collaborate. Uh, what are some of the questions you ask? What are some of the tools, both virtual and, um, and uh, social that you bring into something like that? Well, I, I owned a conference center in, in Ontario uh, and because I was, I, I bought a conference center because I was so fascinated by the power mm -hmm. of convening if done well and what novel approaches can, uh, to meaning can do. And one of the important things in, in any gathering, if that's, that's the nature of the collaboration, is setting the stage right, is, is what, what is the desired outcome? Now, a lot of people tend to focus on what do we do as opposed to what's the impact of what we do. They're one step shy of what the important goal is. And uh, so that, that's the uh, key way of looking at what are the goals of the meeting. And another thing is I think we all experience it. Some people are really persuasive, recognize that if you're not by, persuaded by one approach, you'll be appraised by a totally different approach. And that's that actually is a very useful thing if you're trying to uh, raise money for something or uh, whatever it is. You know, what does the person you're trying to persuade or the group that you're trying to persuade? What are their goals? What are their ways of thinking? How do they define success? I mean, that's always one of the most important, important questions to ask in any of these things. And recognizing that within the same group, they may have different uh, definitions of success themselves. So that means you have to balance your dialogue about what the goal should be so that it'll satisfy both of those parties or at least as close as you can get. And, and frequently, of course, great collaboration involves compromise. But compromise doesn't mean giving away things. It really means constructing something that has value that you couldn't have done if you didn't compromise. And this, that's a different way of looking at it. And I often think of uh, people who are very persistent and you have to admire them even though they can drive you crazy, uh, that they will keep working on something. And if something doesn't work, they'll simply try another door or try another window, or whatever the metaphor might be. 
and recognizing that, think about, as you are designing a meeting, let's say, think about what are the way, other ways of looking at this? What are the uh, concerns? What are the risks? Sometimes people will value certain risks much more than other people in the group. And that's fine, but it's sometimes different because it's being measured emotionally rather than logically. And, you know, that's the way our brains are. We have amygdalas that, that do that function. And uh, if you understand that, and you understand that, yes, you are, if you're going to really get everybody to agree on a common goal, you're going to have to include the critics and the rogues. And you can solve that problem best by dealing with it in advance, setting the stage, making sure that their expectations aren't unreasonable, uh, and, and recognizing what the words are that could be red flags and really undo everything you're trying to do. Because words can uh, solve the problem and they can disrupt the problem. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting moment. So usually in negotiations, right, you, you might see like someone really trying to negotiate on all different fronts. And that's like sort of the first instinct when people go into these things. And, uh, you know, through like this experience is one of the things I learned is like just setting up the stage by explaining people the process that you're going to apply in which it's really like the goal of negotiation is finding the true win-win it's never about like negotiating on all the different fronts because the, you, you can never win that. No one wins in those situations. And sort of just explaining this process of how we're going to look at who cares for what part most and then finding that balanced medium, then sort of jumping into that process has, has definitely worked um, quite well. But it's kind of interesting how that's sort of a very unique form of collaboration in the negotiation space. Well, think about it. And oftentimes when you get people together and you're trying to find a, a common idea, and it may be, let's say if it, were, if it were a business, for example, you have two companies and they both think they own 90% of the, the good idea that's going to work here. The problem is to get them back to 50. Now, if they take the 90-10, they're going to have an enemy that's going to end up you know, compromising their ability to do it alone. And very frequently, they won't be able to do it alone. So the key is to get them to accept that you know, reduction to actually produce a greater result than they would have gotten if they'd gone after it alone. We got, in, in, in medicine, one of the things that we did, dealing particularly with, with new things, we have a regulatory system in the United States uh, run by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And the FDA is, is there to make sure that anything that goes out in the field is safe. Now, that gets confusing. Is a drug safe? Well, we know in many cases a drug can hurt as well as, as solve things. So it's, it's, it has to be used just right. So the FDA makes sure that, that the users understand that. But in fact, when it comes to new things, the FDA... By and large, they're not rewarded for good things. They are penalized for bad things, letting bad things happen. So they're going to be extremely conservative. Well, we developed a, um, an educational program on new technology using, uh, and this is really sort of the earliest days of the Internet, by the way, in the 70s, uh, where video became practical because, you know, uh, uh, novices could use it. Uh, we would, and, and some doctors would show how they did a case, but they would obviously uh, airbrush the the presentation uh, so that it made them look good. Well, we said, you know, most people can understand that. Some some will believe it, but. I would prefer a presentation that has bumps in it, but it's real. And we did that. 
And the whole idea was, in fact, to show what can go wrong and how you avoid it. And if it does happen, how you deal with it. And it was kind of interesting because the surgeons were opposed to that because what we were doing was done with alternatives to surgery. Uh, less trauma, less risk, uh, less time, less cost. You know, how could you argue with that? Well, the surgeons argued with that in by saying, we have been endowed by society. We go through immense training and evaluation to be the people who make these decisions. We're qualified to do it and nobody else is. I took exception to that and 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 a few others did, but in fact, it took us a while, but that was called less invasive medicine. And over time, uh, it became very successful. And uh, it, it did because of this process of having meetings where the leader of the meeting was not a, a the most important people in the field. We got people who were smart, but less important and therefore had less of a bias toward a specific answer. So they weren't supporters of what was going to happen or whatever, but they would guide the presentations. Now you think about that. When you have a meeting and you have people with a variety of ideas, it's important to get those ideas heard. But it's even important to understand who should go first. What would constitute a an objective fair presentation. It's really hard because even the scientists can get caught up in emotional uh, extremes. You know, this is going to revolutionize whatever it is. Revolutionize, that's a word that is a red flag to me. That means they, they are exaggerating. And, uh, you know, okay in some terms, but not in others. And if you want a good decision, then you want it based on the facts as much as you can. So it's a matter of much more complication, as I was trying to imply in those slides uh, uh, earlier, uh, that it can really change the entire uh, way things happen. In fact, the surgeons in, in our great battle here um, actually um, were called in, called in the FDA to attend our meetings to show that we were doing terrible things. Because it turns out the FDA said, hey, I've attended the meeting and these are much more objective than your professional society uh, meetings. And, and uh, you know, it's all, all the problems that occur in any time you communicate, there's always gonna be bias, whether you want to or not. And understanding that and understanding that when you have different people speak, it's very important to get balance in there by getting early speakers that you really you want to make sure their style dominates for the rest of the session. And hopefully you can teach the ones who have been a bit roguish before to be uh, better collaborators. It's really uh, interesting, especially when I think about, I think, John, you and I were both early adopters of technology, and uh, we saw perhaps where technology was going a little differently than it actually went in some cases, that uh, some of the data behind it ends up feeding us one-sided information. Um, I would love to hear some thoughts um, from you and Noreen about how to design technologies for better collaboration. I, I you know, I, I, one of the reasons I liked InSpace from the beginning is I saw how it could mimic the classroom and how you could, you could guide spaces for collaboration. But what could be some things we should could think of? And you know, I'm going to throw in there if you have any thoughts on AI, which comes off so authoritatively and just the opposite of what you're saying, John. It it comes off as I'm right, uh, even though sometimes it puts some little questions. But my data is from 2020. Um, you know, it that can confuse too. How do we how do we look to the future and how these tools can be used? And then afterwards, once you kind of see the example of that, 
you know, we started seeing people would just literally let students run crazy for like two minutes, get the jitters out, and then they were ready to learn. Like those are like the key aspects for me. How do we empower everyone to feel like they, they can run that experience and participate with, the, with their full self? I, I, uh, space uh, and place can make a huge difference in terms of the ability of people to be willing to be more open and also, if it's if it's in nature, uh, nature just really has a powerful way of demonstrating all the things you don't normally think of. Collaboration, for example. I mean, nature is absolutely full of it. Even even enemies collaborate, whether it's bugs and large and we ourselves as as humans, uh, you know, we discover we have a gut biome, a microbiome. And then we have a microbiome within the microbiome, meaning uh, that that's more the, uh, 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 what's the mushroom thing? Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, the point is uh, in nature, you see that collaboration. You tend to have an area hopefully where it can be awesome and awesome things helps people become a bit more humble. And what you want is that confident humility and getting people to demonstrate that. And this is something that, that comes out of FIRST Robotics, uh, meaning the kids go through the process. What they end up with is uh, as good a knowledge as others will have, but they're also humble about it, which means they will question themselves right up the end. They will experiment about everything. And you can do that even if you're not building a product. You can do that verbally uh, in a group. You, you, you test certain questions about how can you look at things? What if we were to turn this upside down? What are the assumptions that we have in going forward? And then a lot of people write down assumptions and then they don't review those assumptions. Assumptions change. It certainly changed technologically, but it can change socially. You know, technology changed social science. I mean, that's why we have social media and we certainly see social media can do good things and can do bad things. But how do you manage that? And how do you do it in an objective way so you're more, more likely to have uh, a, a decision that is implementable and more likely to be successful than another one. And that's by making sure you have a way of communicating that to a lot of people. So in many cases, the decision isn't just the decision. The decision is how to talk about it. You have a meeting before the meeting, which is sort of to set the stage, you have a meeting during the meeting, obviously, uh, say what you're going to say, say it, and then say what you said. And, and that's, you know, the classic uh, facilitation words. And then the other classic facilitation words are, if you're not getting anywhere, anywhere reframe the topic. Mm -hmm. Same topic, but framed in a different way. It causes you to look at it differently. And if you do that with a group with you know, multiple ideas, uh, you frequently find ways to get an answer. I had a partner in, 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 in business uh, who, who was a pretty genius. He was a genius, obviously, in finance. That, that was great. But he had a great way of looking at ideas. And sometimes we'd get a people, group of people together where we did not agree. And we would end up leaving that meeting with a sense that there's no answer to this. This can't be done. Okay, we're going to give up. And three days later, Pete would come back and say, what if we did it this way? Mm -hmm. And people would raise their hand to their head and say, I never thought of that. <laughs> and that's, that's what innovation is. It's not just you know another mechanical product or biological or whatever it is. It's all of these things, but, but it's particularly, it's how you talk about things. Mm -hmm. The words you use can really influence people. 
And you think of people like, you know, Patagonia, you know, institutions that you trust because they're very authentic. What they say and how they say it is just great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the ideas of leave your ego at the door, uh, well, that's fine. And you certainly want that. But there's got to be lots of ways uh, that can really reinforce that. Sometimes it could be humor. Sometimes it could be distraction. Uh, you have something happen at the meeting. Now, I'll admit, this is now turning meetings into a little bit of theater. Because theater is how people really, now you're going to ta tackle the emotional side of getting people to agree. But theater can be really, really possible. And great teachers all are really great at that. They tell stories. That's what the value of stories is. But having a story with a lesson that comes out of the story is really helpful. So sometimes it's good to prepare those sorts of things. If you have something where you're already trying to convince others. But there are so many things going on today, which people call research. But it really isn't research. They'll say, we're 10 times better. Well, 10 times better than what? And, uh, you know, I want to know the numbers. Uh, we doubled our sales. We went from one or two, you know. <laughs> Come on. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to really earn authenticity. And part of it is being very factual on how you talk, but also getting the story part of it in and mixing those two together. That's the ideal balance that you want to have. So I hate to say this, but we've hit the top of the hour already. Um, we had a couple of questions. I don't know if we have time. Noreen, what do you think? So our next thing is networking, the networking lounge. Um, so maybe we can take one or two questions before we go there, or we can, yeah, let's do that, if that's okay with our moderators. Yeah, I'm I'm good with it. Um, let me just scroll back here a little bit, if you don't mind. I'd really like to catch, question, uh, catch there's two questions I want to catch. One is from Jordan Lamott, and his question, he says, since there are many different formats of collaboration, which we went over, and types, and different types of teams, um, how do teams formalize their collaboration strategy? In other words, how do organizations, teams, one, identify the best practices for collaboration for their specific use? And how do they document, align, and assess their collaboration effectiveness? I was particularly interested in the how do we assess, how do we pivot? Uh, if either of you could answer that. You start, Noreen. Yeah, uh, okay, sure. So, so, and this is, this is a topic that's obviously is very dear to my heart. How do we create the most collaborative spaces, right? What does it really mean? And then to make it even more interesting, we top on that is not in physical space, but in virtual space where the games, the rules are a little different, right? So some of the things that we take for granted in physical space, like the ability to just walk into a room and see where everybody is and just grasp that context in just one second, that sometimes completely disappears from virtual space, right? And what's air in the physical space is not really available to us, right? That's why online learning sometimes can be a little dry, right? Like the lack of belonging and connection. So when, when I think about that from that perspective, I think one of the first things that comes up is we all have to be equal here. And this kind of goes into diversity piece. I mean, I'll just give you like a simple example. If you're a really tall person, you enter the room, you have a certain level of presence and uh, you and sometimes the think about the tone of the voice. I just happen to know this because I have a very high tone voice. And uh, naturally people tend to trust sometimes certain characteristics and not so much the others. It's just totally unintentional bias that we all come with. So when we th thought about this, I think this ability to just all of us to be in the same equal circle somehow changes things, the dynamics a little bit. And, um, and also this ability for people to just sort of have this agency to make their own decisions. Like I can go and interact with who I want when I want, right? This is like sort of on my own terms. So then you can really see what people are really thinking, how they're really behaving. And that sort of unfiltered through technology behavior then starts to show more of this context and 
who is talking to who, who is not talking to anyone, right? So like all of those pieces that sort of come very naturally in an interactive space. I think those are some of the pieces, like, as we think about it. And I think, so. like, one of the examples that I love so much is, like, sort of in K-12 space, uh, all this sort of ability for people to move around, like students. I think initially when, like, K-12 uh, teachers would see it, they were like, oh, this is crazy. My students will just run around and I'll never get control of my room. Uh, can we have them stuck in spaces? And we're like, no, we can't do that. Like, it's, you know, in, in a physical space, students can get up and walk. But why are they not doing that? because they sort of command of the room, the teacher knows how to moderate the classroom. And those are such important skills. And having that in a virtual space can be so impactful. And then afterwards, once you kind of see the example of that, you know, we started seeing people would just literally let students run crazy for like two minutes, get the jitters out, and then they were ready to learn. Like those are like the key aspects for me. How do we empower everyone to feel like they they can run that experience and participate with their full self. I, I, a space uh, and place can make a huge difference in terms of the ability of people to be willing to be more open, and also if it's if it's in nature, uh, nature just really has a powerful way of demonstrating all the things you don't normally think of collaboration for example i mean nature is absolutely full of it even even enemies collaborate whether it's bugs and bugs and we ourselves as as humans uh you know we discover we have a gut biome a microbiome and then we have a microbiome within the microbiome meaning uh that that's more the uh uh uh, what's the mushroom thing? Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, the point is, uh, in nature, you see that collaboration. You tend to have an area, hopefully, where it can be awesome. And awesome things helps people become a bit more humble. And what you want is that confident humility and getting people to demonstrate that. And, and this is something that, that comes out of FIRST Robotics, uh, meaning the kids go through the process. What they end up with is uh, as good a knowledge as others will have, but they're also humble about it, which means they will question themselves right up the end. They will experiment about everything. And you can do that even if you're not building a product. You can do that verbally uh, in a group. You, you, you test certain questions about how can you look at things? What if we would turn this upside down? What are the assumptions that we have in going forward? And then a lot of people write down assumptions and then they don't review those assumptions. Assumptions change. It certainly changed technologically, but it can change socially. You know, technology changed social science. I mean, that's why we have social media and we certainly see social media can do good things and can do bad things. But how do you manage that? And how do you do it in an objective way so you're more, more likely to have uh, a, a decision that is implementable and more likely to be successful than another one. And that's by making sure you have a way of communicating that to a lot of people. So in many cases, the decision isn't just the decision. The decision is how to talk about it. You have a meeting before the meeting, which is sort of to set the stage. You have a meeting during the meeting, obviously, uh, say what you're gonna say, say it, and then say what you said. And, and that's you know the classic uh, facilitation words. And then the other classic facilitation words are, if you're not getting anywhere, anywhere reframe the topic. Mm -hmm. Same topic, but framed in a different way. It causes you to look at it differently. And if you do that with a group with you know multiple ideas, uh, <laughs> you frequently find ways to get an answer. I had a partner in, 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 in business uh, who, who was uh, 
pretty genius. He was a genius, obviously, in finance. That that was great. But he had a great way of looking at ideas. And sometimes we'd get a people, group of people together where we did not agree. And we would end up leaving that meeting with a sense that there's no answer to this. This can't be done. Okay, we're going to give up. And three days later, Pete would come back and say, what if we yeah, did it have to this go way? Camera in just a minute. And so people would the raise their hand to their hand bedroom, just and say, I never thought of that. <laughs> and that's, that's what innovation is. It's not just you know, another mechanical product or biological or whatever it is. It's all of these things. But, but it's particularly, it's how you talk about things. Mm -hmm. The words you use can really influence people. And you think of people like, you know, Patagonia, you know, institutions that you trust because they're very authentic. What they say and how they say it is just great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the ideas of leave your ego at the door, uh, well, that's fine. And you certainly want that. But there's got to be lots of ways uh, that can really reinforce that. Sometimes it could be humor. Sometimes it could be distraction. Uh, you have something happen at the meeting. Now, I'll admit, this is now turning meetings into a little bit of theater. Because theater is how people really, now you're going to tack, tackle the emotional side of getting people to agree. But theater can be really, really possible. And great teachers all are really great at that. They tell stories. That's what the value of stories is. But having a story with a lesson that comes out of the story is really helpful. So sometimes it's good to prepare those sorts of things. If you have something where you're really trying to convince others. But there are so many things going on today, which people call research. But it really isn't research. They'll say, we're 10 times better. Well, 10 times better than what? And, uh, you know, I want to know the numbers. Uh, we doubled our sales. We went from one or two, you know. <laughs> Come on. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to really earn authenticity. And part of it is being very factual on how you talk but also getting the story part of it in and mixing those two together. That's the ideal balance that you want to have. There are people who are great at leading collaborations. They themselves aren't necessarily the collaborators. Uh, they are the people who are good at recognizing what the needs are. I mean, among others, these are professional facilitators. They tend to do that. There are some great ones and a lot of not so great ones. Uh, but when you have the great ones, these are the ones who can understand that, hey, there's a question about the goal. We haven't defined it well enough. And uh, that spending time on the definition of what you're going to do so that you have something that can lend itself to detailed analysis, that's really critical. A lot of people end up coming up with goals that are very soft, and therefore you can't tell whether you've been successful or not. That's, that's a great way to produce success, but it's not, not real success. That produces fake success. And I'll just kind of jump in real quick on the documenting piece of it. I think, uh... AI has a great potential in this new environment to document. <clears throat> One of the things we notice is like this documenting of what happened, let's say, in advisor and student meetings and creating action items, follow ups that are super easy to just stay aligned together, right? You have action items you can align on. And this is just simple examples, but having this ability to just take that heavy work out of the way so we can focus on the human piece, that's the most important, right? Great. And then this other, I think Deanna might have just left. I'm not sure. But Deanna, but I know it's being recorded and she can hear it later. She asked in her role, I think a lot about influencing without authority. Can you talk about how you've approached this, developing leadership skills to guide collaboration 
especially with all the new technology for collaboration? Well, first of all, uh, meetings always have leadership, particularly the ones where people say, no, there's no leadership. It's going to be very, very equal. The person who's saying that is probably the leader. <laughs> and basically, they're leading from behind, so to speak, and in terms of establishing the rules and so forth. And sometimes with little examples, uh, they, they, can, they can do that. At some big meetings, for example, where it's more a matter of getting people to understand the complex topics, uh, people will allow questions, but the good leader will uh, have a clock on the wall <laughs> to make sure that the person doesn't overuse their time to take care of that particular meeting disruptor. And for, for me, I think the, the one thing I learned recently from a great, great leader that I really inspire a lot um, is this concept of building connection first and making sure people are heard and seen before talking about anything else. And I think that's, that's really interesting. So as a leader, it's like, you know, in training, <laughs> it's, it's really important to sort of build that connection, invest time in that relationship, that authentic connection before going into um, any other collaboration, partnership, anything else. Well, you know, on the leadership, from my point of view, you have to earn leadership every time you're speaking and uh, or or showing or doing uh, that to me, you know, the difference between managing and leading or the difference between certain fields that are very hierarchical. Medicine is one of them. If you are the God doctor who saves lives, then you know, what you say uh, just dominates everything. And that's not a good opportunity for collaboration. And you remember the time when many uh, airplanes were crashing because they discovered that in the cockpit, the pilot was so cocky that they would shut everybody up. And so other people in the plane who could see a problem coming weren't listened to. And they actually developed a course and you could not become a chief pilot without going through that course. So it's a reminder that that concept is important anywhere. And you have to earn not only that respect, but that authenticity uh, that enables you to really get credit and people will trust you. Mm -hmm. I love that um, years and years ago, um, my students and I were at a conference and they developed games in, in uh, three days of the conference, working all night. And they were asked about, this is before we were working from home, and they were asked to design a game about um, working at home. You know, what would it be like? And they identified that the biggest question that had to be addressed to be able to, in, to let collaboration, <coughs> teamwork, uh, working at home work was trust. It's it's totally true. And then to book on that, I'll say that I was able last semester last year to attend one of the game classes. A new professor, a, a newly minted professor, was teaching this class, and it was across all these different disciplines, lots of uh, diversity on teams. And she, she had them divide up and say, okay. How do we collaborate? Where is it the um, where can we collaborate most effectively on these teams, virtual or in person? And the students were able to pinpoint exactly where what worked when. So, and again, that was end of semester. They established trust. They knew what worked for them as teams and how to collaborate. So, with this, I have to thank everybody for attending. Um, for those of you, I'm going to um, invite Audrey back up. She's got some more um, instructions for us and more opportunity. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Um, if you would like to join us in the networking lounge, take a look on the right side of your screen in the toolbar. We'll click that home button. And then you're able to scroll down with your mouse to locate the networking lounge. Just click join. I can see Noreen's over there already waiting for us to jump over. So uh, we hope to see everybody there. I'll stay here in case anyone has any questions about how to make the jump.
And if you're heading out for the day, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you for taking the time to join us here.